looking for some Thursday nights anyhow into the fifth chapter of the Gospel as recorded by Matthew which is the long edition of the Sermon on the Mount it goes right through the seventh chapter and uh, again the eighth chapter begins there by <coughs> saying in verse 1 when he was come down from the mountain great multitudes followed him as though that he, uh, this is the exclusive property and I believe it is just of, uh, of the believers it was interesting tonight as I was getting ready the TV was on and I'd wanted to hear this um, thing that's being given tonight this lecture on mind control by the Russians and it was very fascinating uh, there's evidence on both sides and evidence by, by, from people who defected that Russia has a system now whereby because the human mind does uh, uh, I don't know what you call it eject or give out rays of electricity you know, that um, right now Russia according to the American government right now Russia is bombing America with low frequency waves which will have some effect on our minds they have um, they had a witness there who said it, it's possible for a man uh, a half mile away to so control uh, certain frequencies that he can neutralize your walking he can neutralize your spine from a half mile distance or they can alter our thinking well I don't doubt that most thinking needs altering but I don't think it needs altering that way and then you see this is this is uh, I, I know it's a diabolical thing and I know that what they want to do is to turn everybody they can Americans rather well into zombies make us subjective uh, I was uh, uh, watched a TV TV thing the other day in the news where a, an unborn child has some deficiency of mind and they had, they had put a, a shringe uh, through the womb of the woman into the child's brain and, and taken out six I think it was six ounces of fluid uh, re not all at once but repeatedly they, they had taken that fluid out of the mind of the child because it's going to be born uh, retarded and I thought yes well that's that may be wonderful but supposing they, they turn it the other way supposing that the government got control and they could inject something into the mind <coughs> from the, of every unborn child it's a strange day that we're living in now the Bible admits that we need a change the scripture says we, we shall all be changed and I often feel like saying don't we need it <coughs> uh, but it means that we should be changed from this style of living we should be changed from this body into a body like unto his glorious body which won't have any blood in it as far as I understand it because he left all his blood at the cross and you remember at the resurrection he said you can come and touch me because a, a spirit hath not flesh and what? bones he never mentions the blood so I consider there that the the fact is that the glorified body doesn't work like this body that we have that that's God's last gift to us that's um, way 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 in the distance <laughs> that if anything is true at all it is true that if any man be in Christ and then it does include women <clears throat> if any man be in Christ he is a new creation you see God isn't a tinker he doesn't patch you up in the weak spots he gives us a new heart and a new spirit and a new mind if he didn't we're not saved if your behavior pattern isn't changed if your desires are not changed then you better check up because there's something very definitely wrong now this this Sermon on the Mount <coughs> again I, I, I think is given exclusively to the disciples again to recap for those who are not here this this there are 39 books in the Old Testament therefore Matthew the first book in the New Testament is the 40th well 40 the number 40 is typical of, of a period of pr probation or testing Moses was 40 what days on the mount Israel was how many years in the wilderness okay a bit, the, Jesus was tempted wherever there's 40 it, it suggests that you're in a kind of a captivity to, to a testing a probationary period and, and the 40th book you say well, well what, what probation is there here what testing is there here it was Israel being tested with the living God in the midst they had believed for years they had recited uh, for years the 35th of Isaiah that when he is come he will open the eyes of the blind and so forth and so on and they were tested with the Christ of God with the living God in their midst and what did they do they, they, they fell again going back the first Adam came into the world a perfect man he must have been something I kind of figured he was maybe about six feet six tall and uh, handsome naturally because you can still see that in many of us men I mean he hasn't quite worn out <coughs> but I think he was very attractive and uh, I think he, he had a super brain 
and I believe he had a perfect spirit and a perfect mind and a perfect will and uh, yet in a, in a perfect environment he failed there was nothing, nothing at all that should have caused him to fall but he fell now Jesus, the last Adam, again not the second Adam, he's the last Adam came into an imperfect world with everything that had gone out of kilter that could go out of kilter he was born in a slave system he, he parallels very much the life of Moses Moses was born in a slave system Moses went down to Egypt Jesus went down to Egypt you, you read the two stories they're very very parallel and uh, and yet when Jesus came into the world and it, uh, we, we need to notice this because we skip over it so much there's a lot of yeah kind of sloppy talk about the baptism you know get this get that get the other if, if you claim to have that and you haven't had a, yet a head-on collision with Satan I think there's something wrong because immediately Jesus was anointed of the Spirit he was uh, 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 me, anointed by the Spirit he was led of the Spirit Not some people say then he was led of the devil no he wasn't, he was led of the Spirit and he had those 40 days of encounter in which he was tested on all points like as we are let's get this clear in our minds uh, there's no finality to the Christian life this side of eternity we're never going to get a graduation certificate from God because uh, he says now look you're spiritual enough now you can just uh, relax you know you know enough of the Bible and you've had all the experience at last days and uh, <clears throat> you're, you're, you're ready to you know just just wait till the Lord calls you home uh, you know like when you wake up in the morning you keep feeling at your back to see if your wings are sprouting <clears throat> or if your pillars are a bit uncomfortable you'll feel to see if your halo dropped off but there's none of that business in it it's, it's encouraging isn't it to, to realize that however mature these men and women of God became they were once like us they had nothing extra they were like us spirit, soul and body and mind and faculty and will and everything has to be brought into subjection to God now again this Sermon on the Mount I think is showing us the man or the woman who comes to maturity I think the reason now we have no revival in the church is we have no maturity we're not mature enough to handle it we, we get caught away with any novelty we get switched off from spirituality to worldliness to you know you, you, some, some Christians haven't smiled for the last uh, about 30 days you know since the baseball strike was on <laughs> I mean good night you come home from church bored Sunday morning and you did have the joy of watching a baseball match Sunday afternoon now there's no baseball I mean how bad can it get there's even the threat of a football strike that will end the nation we better dig our grave I mean we can't put up with these trials and tribulations I mean children of Israel never had all like this and Paul didn't but you see if, if, if this teaching uh, as I understand this marvelous teaching of the Lord Jesus here is the, the master preaching the master sermon nobody's ever superseded this sermon what he's showing us is that the true Christian life doesn't need any props that the joy of the Lord is internal it's not external we're not depending on happiness which is which comes from the word hap which means chance we don't go up and down like a, at least we ought not to like a yo-yo when things are dark well anybody in the world can go that way you know many Christians react exactly as the world reacts now here's a simple question um, do, I, do I control the Christian life or does the Christian life control me? I mean do I get my teeth and say well I, I suppose I'll have to you know I'm a Christian I better just try and get through this thing uh, it's pretty tough and huh? Or is there the gentle flow of the Spirit that, that, that was in the Lord Jesus Christ? Is the Spirit in control? Paul, Paul goes on to one of the most massive statements anywhere when he says, I am crucified with Christ. Not I was, I am. You see, you can go make a deal with God at the altar and then in two weeks after you could have reneged on all the things you said. I say again that one of the, I, I think the most strong temptations to many Christians is come down from the cross and save yourself. I mean, after all, other Christians are getting away with it, aren't they? Why, why shouldn't you do the same thing? And the temptation to think is to think that if I say gossiped and slandered like like Moses' sister did, and God doesn't strike me with leprosy, or 
one of the very famous men, everybody here knows his name, said to me one day. He said, well then, I, I know that wasn't right, the thing I did, but after all, God hasn't sent any judgment. Well, in the Old Testament, he used to do that. Miriam gossiped, she became as white as snow, as a leper. <coughs> Cain slew Abel, his brother, immediately God put a mark on his forehead. Doesn't do it anymore. Well, there's a difference, you see, between, between justice and mercy. Oh no, oh no, don't, don't fool yourself. No, you better stay by the book. He has appointed a day. He's keeping a count, he's keeping a tab on your life, he's keeping a tab on my life. He's appointed a day in which he's going to judge the world. I haven't got by with it. I've excused myself. I've tried to forget, forget it, but I'm, I should have put that thing right with God. Now, away again, the, the entrance to the kingdom here. And Jesus had been talking about the kingdom in the previous chapter, in chapter 4. It says there in verse 23, Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and preaching. He makes a distinction between teaching and preaching. The gospel of the kingdom healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. And his fame went throughout all Syria and they brought unto him all the sick people that were taken with divers or different and many diseases and torments, those that were possessed with devils, those that were lunatic, those that had palsy, and he healed them. There followed him great multitudes of people from Galilee and Decapolis and Jerusalem and from Judea and, and beyond Jordan. Now he has manifested, to me, he's saying this is the full, co I mean, this is the full content of, of the kingdom of God. I know it was very interesting, about a month ago, some of you were there, when, when um, what was his name, Dean, what was his name? Sherman. Sherman, thank you, yeah, Sherman, Dean Sherman, uh, gave us that talk and he began by saying, right now, you know, he said, I'm a bit of an analyst, and what I'm trying to find now, what is the secret, wasn't that what he said? The secret of the kingdom of God. What is it? Well, well that's, that's what it's all about. You see, we're looking for, a, for a, a kingdom to come. No, Jesus says the kingdom of God is within you. And the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and joy and peace in the Holy Ghost. Now, if God has set up that kingdom within me, I think of a phrase of Wesley's there when he says, Thy nature, gracious Lord, in part, come quickly from above, write thy new name upon my heart, thy new best name of love. Paul, Peter says, we are made partakers of the divine nature. One of the most staggering things I think that uh, the word of God says, I think John says both of them, is that when Jesus says that the that, that, that prince of this world, Satan cometh and he findeth nothing in me. And then John compliments that in his epistle by saying, as he was, so are we in this world. You know, there's a man in, what was it, was it Norway that uh, during World War II and he was caught, caught quizzling and, and he let his government down very badly. He was corresponding with the Germans. The government didn't know and he was giving away secrets, giving away secrets. He was in constant contact with the enemy and he was serving the enemy very well. Now, is there a quizzling in us? I mean, am I doing things because I have to do them or because I want to do them? That cuts both ways. People say sometimes, oh, I can't help myself, I have to do it because I'm sinful. You don't have to do anything because you're sinful. You do it because you want to do it. <coughs> now, conversely, even here, it's possible for you to uh, say, well, uh, you know, if I hold back a bit, so so will take the big load uh, and I'll get less to do. You know, if you've got three jobs to do, one's a real rotten job, you say, I'm going to do these two and leave the other two last. That's, that's pure nonsense, that's silly. Because it's going to be dragging on your mind all the time. Why not kill the thing? Do it first and then you feel very easy to do the second thing. But we're prone rather to put off the evil day. Put, I don't want to do that. I wouldn't like to do that. It's a lousy job. They should have given someone else it. Why? Why should they? I mean, you, it, it's easy to get brave with your eyes closed and the meetings running high. There's all the emotion. Yes, Lord, we're the whole realm of nature, mine. I'll give you that. And you won't get out of bed half an hour earlier in the morning. Or do you think he takes any notice of you? You see, the Christian life is a, is a life of discipline. Now, if we're going to enter into this kingdom, we come again, as it says here, let's look at it now in the fifth chapter of Matthew. He opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit. Poor in spirit. 
And again, to emphasize the words of, of David, he repeatedly says this, O oh, man cried. Now, how was he poor? He's a king, he's got servants, he's got soldiers. He's on the top of the charts musically. He'd written more psalms than anybody else. Why is he poor? But he recognizes that is the way to God. Blessed are the poor in spirit. And then, blessed are they that mourn. They mourn over their poverty. They mourn over their inabilities. And then, right after that, <clears throat> blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. And then tonight's verse is verse 7. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. We don't live in a very merciful world, do we? And you know what people usually say? Well, no, thank God for mercy. Because if we don't have mercy, we love judgment. Now, I, I don't, justice, I don't believe that ju just mercy is the opposite of justice. <coughs> I believe that mercy is the opposite of revenge. You see, God is a God of justice. Some people would like, don't like the Old Testament. They say, oh, oh, there's so much justice there and there's no mercy. And some people want all the mercy of the New Testament without the judgment of the Old Testament. But remember the, the word says, you can check it yourself, find it, do some a little homework, that at the cross mercy and truth met together and righteousness and peace kissed each other. Again, the greatest penitential psalm, Paul, uh, pardon me, David wrote at least eight penitential psalms and, and, and the greatest of all surely is the 51st psalm where he begins, this king, this nobleman, this man that's done everything for Israel is their superman they've even changed the, the, the music you know they were singing Saul has slain his thousands uh, but now they've changed that they've made it bad Saul can't bear it they're singing Saul has slain his thousands but David is tens of thousands oh handsome David I have a, a, a head of David not, not his real head but uh, a, a, a stone head in my, in my room I look at it very often it's that of Michelangelo's you know that noble face curly hair such a fine featured man and then he comes groveling, he comes groveling. He doesn't say, now Lord, look at it this way, you know, I've written more psalms of praise and adoration, I mean, I've made one blunder, now don't be too hard on me, I mean, let's have a bit of mercy around. No, no, he doesn't come that way. He comes, he's crumpled up, and he, he, he pleads, he begs, he whines, he says, have mercy upon me, O God. And uh, Paul says the same thing right into Timothy. I was an evildoer, but God who is rich in mercy, in his great love wherewith he hath loved us. There's a great old hymn. Uh, it wasn't written as a hymn. It were, there were parts extracted from letters of Samuel Rutherford. Uh, the, the thing is called The Sands of Time Are Sinking. And, and he says in it, With mercy and with judgment, my web of time he wove. And I, the dew, uh, uh, and I, the dew of sorrow, was lustered by his love. I blessed the hand that guided. I blessed the heart that planned. When throne where glory dwelleth in Emmanuel's land. You see, you, you, you can't have judgment without, uh, real judgment without mercy, and you can't have mercy without judgment. Now, if you go back, uh, go back here into uh, the, one of the wisest books ever in this book of wisdom, into uh, Proverbs chapter 11 and verse 17. See what that verse says there. Okay, Proverbs chapter 11, verse 17. The merciful man doeth good to his own soul, but he that is cruel troubleth his own flesh. Now, step back while you're in that chapter of verse 14, because you need to rivet this in your mind, I think. You know what you should do <coughs> to be kind to yourself? Because we're, we're all prone to be lazy. There aren't many of us that, 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 that are not lazy. We have a streak of laziness in us. We get by with the least if we can. I think the trouble with most people in the, in the service of God is we, we get by with minimum spirituality. I want enough, enough spirituality to keep me out of hell, and, uh, but I don't want to strive. I don't want to be like the Apostle Paul. You know, that poor guy never gave up. When he's in prison, he's as happy as when he's anywhere else. In fact, he says while writing his prison epistles, he's writing to folk who are at home, living it easy, and putting their feet up and snoozing, and, and he says, rejoice in the Lord, and again I say rejoice. And yet it seems to me, and I, I'm confirmed in this, that, that most people want to go to heaven on minimum spirituality. 
Now you may not have that much education, I don't know if you have or you haven't, but I'll tell you what. Education is one thing, wisdom is something else. We live in a world that's overburdened with knowledge, it sure isn't overburdened with wisdom. And we need that wisdom. The scripture says that Jesus Christ is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. And so if you're going to be wise, do you know what you do? You, you could do this at least. You could memorize one verse of Proverbs a week. I know a home, and they're pretty wealthy folk. I believe they have their own plane, and uh, I don't know how many cars they have, and uh, the wife is a doctor, and uh, the husband is a, a heart specialist, does open heart surgery, and they have three children, and they have a blackboard um, as long as this mantel shelf, and when they sit down for breakfast, Daddy had chalked on the scripture. That's the scripture for the day, let's all recite it, they all recite it. When they come home at lunch, they all recite the scripture. Before they go to bed at night, they recite the scripture. A verse a day. And after he taught them that, when they were still children, he, learned, he, he wrote up strange things, Alpha, Beta, Gamma, Delta. Yeah, I want you to learn now, I want you to learn the, learn the Greek alphabet. And when they got that, he, he put up the Hebrew signs and he taught them Hebrew. And instead of buying them toys, he bought them uh, things, well, well, when they're still in about 12 or 13, he, he sent them to have a course in uh, uh, radio knowledge, techni techni technicalities. And then when they got to 15 and 16, he sent to Ford's and he got all the books that Ford's have for years and years and years. And uh, he went down and got a set of tools, and he got a jack. And he did all his own car repairs with the children on a Saturday instead of fooling around. You know, those three guys now, one of them is still in his teens, can pilot a plane, he, uh, radio, he's smart at radio, he can do quite a lot with TV. Why? I don't believe any more brains than anybody else, but he used them better. You see, we've got the idea that our job is to keep our children happy, and we'll entertain them if we make idiots of them. I don't believe that's a thing at all. I, I'm believing more and more, and particularly this generation, in which I'm not drunk, it's just that this isn't steady. <coughs> uh, I believe in our day, it's the hardest day ever to raise children. And what? It's going to get harder and harder. It sure is. There's all kinds of devices coming up to seduce the minds of children, to keep them away from spiritual things. Now, there's no greater wisdom. I don't care how smart a man is. I don't care if he's 50 DDs or PhDs or what he has. If he doesn't know the Word of God, he's still ignorant. And on the other hand, if he has no degrees and knows the Word of God, he's very wise. Because he's not going to slip into the pitfalls that other people say. I believe that God has given us everything, as his Word says, that we need regarding spirituality. That everything, as Peter says, isn't it, Peter? everything that pertains to, to life and to holiness. Uh, come, come up down to the back of the book here now. Come down to James. Uh, let me see. Chapter, uh, chapter 2 and verse 13. He shall have judgment without mercy, that has showed no mercy. And mercy rejoiceth against judgment. Now there's something for you to, there's something for you to chew on. He shall have judgment without mercy, that hath showed no mercy. And mercy rejoiceth against judgment. You see, part of this great sermon on the mount is this, With what measure ye meet, it shall be meted unto you again. Remember the story about in the 18th of Matthew where a, a man met a friend one day and he said, hey, you owe me so much and you better pay up. It was only trivial. If you don't pay, I'll cast you into jail and so he did the worst thing for him. That, no, the, the, the boss, he owed his boss, uh, uh, pardon me, let me get it straight here. The boss, uh, he owed money to and, and his boss forgave him everything. He went away feeling on cloud nine, as we say, and he go, comes to his friend who owes him a dime, and he says, listen, you better pay that, I'll get you in jail. And so he, he exacted the full total of the law on him. What happened? The boss came back and uh, beat him up for it, sent him to jail for it. 
You see, with what measure you meet, it should be meted unto you again. Listen, when something comes in your life, don't start grumbling, complain, say, wait a minute, let me go back, let me track back in my mind. Did I once give somebody else a raw deal like that? Did I, did I once let somebody else down with a bang? I mean, am I, is it really that I reap what I sow? You know, what, one of the greatest things of all is, is, in this life, I think, is forgiveness. And that amazing man Spurgeon, the more I read of him, the more he startles me. A man that was comparatively illiterate, that built the greatest church in London in the day that he was there, preached to 6,000 people every Sunday morning, another 6,000 every Sunday night. He, he ran a, a, a college for, for young men that were not privileged like some other young men. He also ran orphanages. And one day, <coughs> he asked for a boy to take a bag of gold. They used to have little, uh, like a, um, a wash leather bag, you know, and we used to have one at our house. <laughs> there not much gold in it, but they put gold in it. And, and he said to this little boy, now you take it across London Bridge to so-and-so. And the little boy went, but on the way he saw something in the shop and he thought, well, now, oh mercy, I better, I, I could buy that, I've got lots. And, and the little fellow fell for the temptation. He went and he bought what he wanted, then suddenly realized the mess he was in. He had to go back. No, I think he ran away, but finally he was brought back to Mr. Spurgeon. And Mr. Spurgeon said, what did you do? And he cried and whimpered and said what he'd done and so forth. And that now Mr. Spurgeon said, that's the first time you've ever had a blemish on your record while you've been in this orphanage. And I freely, freely forgive you. And the big man hugged the little fellow and the little guy ran away, full of joy. The next week, the same errand had to be done and Mr. Spurgeon sent for the same boy. And he said, now here's the bag of gold, just like you had last week. Hold it tight, keep it in your trouser pocket and... Off you go over London Bridge and go to so-and-so, the same place you went last week. And little boy uh, cried and blurted out. He said, but sir, I, 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 I'm the boy that, that did the wrong thing last week. Yes, Spurgeon said, but I've forgiven you. I've forgiven you. That's all forgotten. And we used to sing a chorus years ago, when God forgives, he forgets. But you know, we're, we're not all like that. And you see, sometimes when God has forgiven our sins, the consequence of sin still stays there. For instance, I know a man who slipped from his ear right down under here because he was in a brawl and somebody pulled a razor or something and slashed him. Now he'd been a wicked man and God forgave his sin. He's one of the most charming men you could meet. <clears throat> but the scar is still there. Sometimes we've done wrong in our lives. God forgives. I think particularly in the area of sex, a, a, a girl gets into trouble and um, maybe she takes it, has a baby and she's left with that baby for years and the guy who gave her the baby's gone off and maybe done the same thing to 20 more girls. He doesn't have to suffer. And there's no way though God forgives her and she becomes a saint of God and to thank God it does happen. She still feels that sense of reproach or sorrow or, or wishes she's done some other thing like that. It's still there. And the same thing works out for men in so many different ways. But God is rich in mercy. He's rich in wisdom. He's rich in knowledge. He's rich in power. Let I say again, as I said at the beginning, there are not many merciful people. This is a merciless generation in which we live. One great writer in America says, we're the most cruel generation that the world has ever known. We're the most scientific, we're the most cultured, we've lovely homes, we've super intellects, man alive. When I, when I see one of those great uh, uh, converters like they had in, on, the, on the news at six o'clock tonight, showing how they could uh, transfer, uh, what, what is it, radium and so forth and all the other stuff and make atom bombs out of it. And I looked at that huge thing and thought, who in the world has brains to put that together? Or getting that thing that they were shooting through the sky the other week that has a million parts in it and they all function. Well, I couldn't do a thing with it. I wouldn't know where to start. And yet, despite that, we're cruel, we're lawless, we're relentless. There's never been more cruelty. You know, uh, people always say, oh, there's so much crime, there's so much wickedness, I hate to read about rapes, I hate to read about... And then they sit down and watch it for three hours on TV at night. If we showed the brutality to animals on any given radio station, any, any given TV station at night, if we showed that brutality about animals, we, we'd be having every weekend we'd have people parading <coughs> through the cities, objecting to the way we treat animals. 
Not going to let it all go by on the screen. I mean, it's the, it's the way of life. Cruelty, injustice, wickedness, crime, whatever you want to call it. And you know, when it comes down to the nitty gritty, there's not a great deal of mercy, I think, as in the in the uh, <coughs> amongst Christians. You know what mercy does? I believe that mercy is an attribute of love. You see, in the first part of this study that we've been taking in, in Matthew 5, the first things that are mentioned there, it shows the sinner, as it were, in, a, in, a, in an attitude of subjection, in an attitude of pleading before God. These are the things he wants. But there's a turn round in this verse. This is where action comes in. It's something that flows out of me. Blessed are the merciful. What is mercy? I would say mercy is compassion on somebody on, uh, over you could exercise power and authority because they've done you an injury. And you could treat them and, and get out of them what, what you deserve, what you want, or on the other hand you could say, well, wait a minute, what, what? You see, this is a, the whole argument of this teaching of Jesus, isn't it? As you would that men should do unto you, so do ye unto them. Or go, go the second mile. Can you remember somewhere in your life when you, somebody came in your life you didn't like and before long you find an excuse to dump them? Now what if God dumped us as quickly as we dump other people? Hmm? Supposing he were as short in patience and love and mercy as we are. Most of us were in bad shape. Mercy, I believe, is, is it, it, it's active. It, it's pity in action. You, in, there is a sense in which you, you can't just believe in mercy, you've got to act in mercy. It demands activity. It's not that saying, well, I, I believe I'm one of the most merciful men in the world, you know. I've always believed in mercy, and I always shall, and I want to be more merciful, and never do a thing about it. What good is it? See, the older you get, the, re the more you realize you're, uh, you're very smart not to shout every conviction you have from the house top, because it might catch up with you next week. You know, I, I, I said the other Sunday, I've got to preach this Sunday morning, so pray for me. And I'm going to go down again into that chapter. It's the most awesome chapter nearly in the Bible, John 17. And I said, let's, let, remember the framework. The framework is, to me, shattering. Mercy, mercy. Read that 16th chapter and run through the 18th and st uh, 17th and start at the 18th. Immediately Jesus goes to the book, over the book Kidron, away into the Garden of Gethsemane. But the last verse in the, in the 16th chapter says, and I remember stressing this, and as I stressed it, saying to myself, well, I've had it pretty easy lately. In the world you shall have tribulation. And I remember as I thought, I thought well, man, I've had a, a, a very comfortable time this year. Uh, last year was rough. I had surgery twice, was in hospital. All of this been a good year. And uh, felt real good. Next morning we went to town, half past nine. Came back at half past eleven. The house was robbed. Stuff was thrown all over the place. And uh, guys had stolen our stuff. And immediately came back, well, you said it yesterday, didn't you? Now, that's a mild form of tribulation. That's, uh, surely it is. I can live without it. But on the other hand, you see, if, if all I do is sit in a chair and write to others, then immediately I become a philosopher. You can say what you like, but it's like that there's an old ditty. It was, you know, the great hymns were written in England. <coughs> this is a ditty. It was written in America. And uh, <coughs> do you remember what it, what it's, uh, what it says? What, they're, they're not... Uh, they're watching how you walk, not listening to your talk. Hmm? Isn't that true? People read us by our actions, not by our lips. You can say the bravest thing in the world and the biggest coward going. You can talk about love and be cantankerous. You can talk about being long-suffering and being impatient. You see, the... the as I say again, as I see it again, mercy is is loving action. It's when you could screw the other fellow's neck round. Instead of that, you say, "Listen, guy, I'm going to let you off the hook." Because now it doesn't mean you are. It it's not, doesn't mean you condone sin. Um, 
you can't you, you couldn't translate it or transliterate it like we do some of the scriptures and say for instance um, well it says blessed are the merciful for they shall obtain mercy well uh, blessed are those who um, cover up their faults and their faults will be covered up it doesn't say that the supreme example I think is the, is the case of the man going down from Jerusalem to Jericho you know the old Samaritan story he fell among thieves what happened well uh, there was a priest and a Levi uh, a preacher in Ireland was teaching this and he said well why didn't the priest go over and, and help the man and the little boy said because he'd been robbed already <coughs> but uh, why didn't he go help him? Oh, I was in too much. He, he was just thinking a theological thing out. They just had a discussion up in Jerusalem and, uh, uh, you don't, don't get your hands all bloody anywhere. There's nowhere to wash and he, I suppose he's dead. I won't bother to go. So he left him and a Levite came down and, uh, and he didn't bother with him. But a Samaritan, and the Samaritans were dogs in the eyes of the Jews. Lord, you're not going through Jeru you're not going through Samaria. Yes, I'm going through Samaria. Oh, 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 no. Samaritans gee they stink and it was a Samaritan the most despised man that said well I can't leave another fellow at the side of the road he's a human being whoever he is and he goes and he remember and he he bound up his wounds and he poured in oil and wine and he put him on his own beast that was risky why didn't he say my goodness there's, 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 there's thieves around here come on get up get up get up let's get down as quickly as we can to Jericho it's, it's dangerous being around here Instead of that, he gets off the beast, he puts the other man on, and he slugs it on foot, and he gets down to the city, and he says to the man, now here, take care of him. And he took out two pence. The holiness people said that was the first and second blessing, I'm not, I'm not sure that's right, but anyhow, he, he took out two pence, and said, take care of him, and whatsoever thou spendest more, when I come back, put it on my bill, I'll do it. Now, if that isn't mercy, what is? I think of the story I was reading it today it's, it's, it's a fascinating fascinating story we, uh, man, we should read these stories over and over in uh, what the 42nd chapter of Genesis remember what it is without looking it's the story of a man who had a very very raw deal he lived up here and from there his father sent him down to Dothan with uh, food for his brothers and when he got to Dothan they put him down in the pit and then they lifted out of the pit and they sold him to Ishmael and took him down to Egypt and when he got to Egypt they put him down in a pit again now I figure he was about 17 years of age and he stayed there <coughs> until he was 30 years of age pretty long while isn't it good time to dry out his brothers sold him for what well, the same thing that Jesus was sold for. They sold him for envy. You see, if you want to know where you are spiritually, you don't have to necessarily listen to me or somebody's tape. All you have to read is, is the Sermon on the Mount. And when you've read that, read 1 Corinthians 13. And instead of putting love suffereth long and is kind, love envieth not, love wanteth, put yourself in there. I suffer long, I'm kind, I envy nobody, I'm never rude, I'm never resentful, I'm never glad when others go wrong, I'm always glad joyful to believe the best I hope all things I endure all things come on how are you getting on you feel good comfortable see the trouble is we, 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 we rejoice in sins forgiven sure we should some of us are enough to some of us are sin enough to damn a dozen people never <laughs> mind ourselves but God in his infinite mercy he forgives and he forgets I remember about two years ago it suddenly struck me that never once did God throw up in the face of Moses you better watch your step you're a murderer Nobody knows where the body is. I know where the body is. I know where you're putting down and you smooth the sand over. I, can, I know the place all right, so you better watch out because I'll be after. He never, never once threw his sin in his face. That, when he got angry for 30 seconds, he got punished for 40 years. You see, think, we think all you have to do is be nice and sweet, even if you have a rebellion inside, if there's somebody you hate, and you let that cancer go and, and then you become dispirited and heavy and get into bondage. We wouldn't do that if we read the word of God very closely. Now what happens, this, this fellow goes in prison and when he's there, the butcher and the baker or somebody were there and, and he interpreted their dreams and he said, you're going to get out and they got out and he's left holding the bag as we say. Why does God let the other rascals out? Let him stay there. But then, 
You see, he goes down, 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 down. And then God starts and he goes up, 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 up until he sits on the throne with the king and he takes the king's throne over when the king goes out of town and here he is, God has exalted him. Now what does he do? <coughs> Pardon me. Uh, Genesis 44 says, He, that is Joseph, commanded the steward of his house, saying, Fill the men's sacks with food as much as they can carry and put every man's money in his sack. Mm. Isn't that merciful? He could have run them all off into jail. These were all his brothers cringing at his feet, saying, we're starving, we're starving where we live. Can you, can you give us some food? He could have told them where to get off. Instead of that, he, he, he teases them, doesn't he? <clears throat> and he put their, their uh, money back in their sack. And then he put the king's cup in the sack and let them go. And then they, they, they ran after them. And when they got there, it says... Uh, with whomsoever of thy servants the cup be found, both let him die, and we also will be my Lord's bondmen. That's what one of the one of the sons said. One of the brothers said, "We we haven't done it. You can search our bags. You you're wasting your time. We we don't have a bag. We we brought money with us, and we left the money in your office. And we just went to get our asses, and all we did was put our sacks on the back of the asses, and." And you're accusing us of stealing that and the king's cat not only alive. I'll tell you what, if you find it anywhere, just kill us. Well, that's a merciful thing. The man didn't take them at his word. That was mercy, wasn't it? Because they found it. But what do you want us to do now? <clears throat> Verse 19 says, My Lord asked his servant, saying, Have you a father or a brother? We said unto my Lord, We have a father, an old man, and a child of his old age, a little one, and his brother is dead, and he alone is left of his mother, and his father loveth him. Verse 26, We cannot go down. If our youngest brother be with us, then we will go down, for we may not see the man's face again, except our youngest brother be with us. This is what they're saying to the old man, to their father, now they've got back home. Verse 30 says, Now therefore, when I come to thy servant, my father, and the lad is not with us, seeing that his life is bound up in the lad's life, well, uh, if, we, if we ask, uh, you, you see, what, what happened is this, that we, we did have another brother, and, and he went out and he never came back. We think maybe the, the uh, beast devoured him. And they don't know, they thought this man who is a king is their brother. Joseph could not refrain himself before all of them that stood by him, and he cried. Let every man go out from me. And there stood no man with him while Joseph made himself known to his brethren. And he wept aloud, the margin says, with his voice weeping. In other words, he wasn't silently sobbing, he was uttering great groans of, of sorrow. Remember later he says, ye meant it for evil, but I meant it for good. Now, now how, how do you think they felt? You know, it's so easy to read these stories and you don't get any emotion or anything out of them, that these guys that saw this little guy away, he'd lived in misery, he'd had nightmares, he, He'd been living in a lousy prison. He'd had for years and years, maybe 17 years of misery. And now they face this man who has all this power and he suddenly sends every servant out, get out of here a minute, and, and he sends all the servants out and he takes off his crown and he pulls off his beautiful garments. He says, look, I, I am your brother that you lost, the brother that you were treated, the brother that you sold into slavery. Well, that's surely mercy. He could have said, well, I've, uh, I've teased you now for a few months because it took them months to go back to the father and come back again. They know they didn't happen to catch a jet. They went on the back of donkey. I'm going to take it out of your, your hide this time. You're all going to jail for the same period of time you put me in jail. Or I'll give you half a sentence. Instead of that, what did he do? He showed mercy. There's another great story. Do you remember the time when According to his own word, David was hunted like a partridge in the mountains. And one night he went into the cave and there was the king asleep. And his son says, there you are, God delivered him into your hand. Just, just let me take my knife and stab him. He, he, he won't know anything about it. He's the greatest chance you've ever had. You can end all the misery. You can go back and take the throne. He says, no, just, just cut a bit off the end of that long robe he's wearing. 
Remember, he went across the valley and they hollered, Hey, hey, is the king there? And I said, oh, what? Well, uh, here's a piece of his... Uh, look at the bottom of it. He's talking about coming to the place where, where there's, there's nothing in the world with all its vanity, all of its pleasures, pomp and its pride. Give me but Jesus, my Lord, crucified. But we realize, all right, if you want it, in American language, J.B. Simpson talks about the perishing things of clay, born but for one brief day. Oh, what a lot of false values we have. If we have a big house, if we own this, if we own a yacht, if we own a plane, if we own something else. So what? So what? Am I better off if I have 50 acres more than the other man? If I have a Rolls Royce while well, he's only got a scruffy little Mercedes? Uh, uh, I've got a big jet and all he has is a Cessna or something? Uh, what, what, uh, where, where do you stop with your s stupid comparisons? You see, it's, it's not, it wasn't difficult. I used to wonder why my old granny, and she was a precious woman. I used to wonder why uh, she was content in a little cottage. Oh, it was spotlessly clean, and she polished the furniture, and my goodness, you know, those days they had great lace curtains, you had to take them down and wash them and iron them, and oh, murder. I don't know what modern women do, honestly, I don't. You know, they've got bed sheets that don't need ironing, husband shirts don't need ironing, the bread doesn't need cutting. Goodness me, all they do is press buttons. They're tired at the end of the day pressing buttons. I remember coming home from school Monday, mother's back was nearly broken over a rush, rub, rubbing board, you know, rub, 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 rub. You put all those heavy things on a line outside the house, and you know, I, when a blanket's full of water, because I used to squeeze them with the hands, and you hang it up, and then, whoop, you're looking, oh, the whole thing had come down in the mud. <laughs> and you take them all back again into the house, and wash them all again, and then the next day was a day to dry them, the next day was a day to iron them, oh, mercy. All those things have gone, new ladies and Mr. Lot of Joys, <coughs> or, or, or the chores, which, whichever you want to call them. But you know, I, I realized, I was thinking over this recently, my granny just about lived on a shoestring. She was always immaculate there, had lovely gray hair there, and she always had a kind of um, beautiful little pinafore on, and she used to sing, rock in a chair, sing, take time to be holy, and all the rest of the things. You know, I suddenly realized that she got all the treasures on the inside. See, some people wear all the treasures hanging from their ears or around the neck or some other way. And usually the tre folk that have most treasures outside don't have the most treasures inside. It's easy to say that the things of earth grow strangely dim, but we happen to live in the competitive world. Even in church circles. You see Mary Jane's ring? <laughs> I guess it is not more than a quarter of a carrot. I'm not sure if it's a carrot or a turnip, but anyhow. It's a shuffling little thing there. I mean, you'd think any fellow would be embarrassed to buy it. Oh, yeah, oh, I've always admired. What is yours? Yours is a carrot. Is it really? Yeah, it's a whole carrot. So what? Are you going to suggest the guy loves the girl more because she's a turnip on a finger or a something else on a finger, a cauliflower or something? He, if he's any sense, that's no value. If she's any sense, that doesn't persuade her at all. Is he? I love that 45th Psalm that says the king's daughter... Do you remember it? Can you finish it? Is what? Is all glorious within. The king's daughter is all glorious within. Have you ever tried to figure what kind of demands Judas made on Jesus? All the other disciples, because the heaven knows that I think they were all DDs, you know. They all had a DD degree. They were dumb disciples. They had to be, they couldn't have finished up the way they finished it, I've told you more than once. If, they, if they'd really believed him, they'd all have been lined up that resurrection morning at the tomb waiting for him. There wasn't one of them there, they didn't believe him. <coughs> and even when they got the news that he was resurrected, oh come on, you're not so, oh that woman, woman running up the road screaming, he's risen, he's risen, he's risen. But, you know, women are emotional, you can turn them anywhere. <laughs> and sometimes God takes us at our word, eh? as, uh, the word that we utter. Again, Thomas says, well, look, you, you guys are as emotional as the women you say is risen. You know what I believe? <laughs> when I put my finger in the nail print and I lift his shirt up and I put my hand in his side, then I believe. 
Within a few hours, Jesus comes in the room. How do you think Thomas felt? Do you think he said, hey, Lord, I know it's you. Hey, come on, I want to shake hands with you. I think he said, don't don't make me prove it. Come on, Thomas. Come on, Thomas, come on, Thomas. All the other disciples looking at him. Give me a finger. There it is. Look, now, now, that's where the nail went through. Here's my side. See where the sword went through. Hmm? You know, sometimes if you really check up on our lives, somewhere in your high peak of excitement or emotion or something, you made a vow to God, you can have anything you like in my life. Ah, and he comes and asks you to pay the bill. Oh, I was mistaken. After all, Mary there isn't doing it. Well, Mary didn't make a vow like you did. See, there's no, there's no such thing as getting on a belt line like you, the, you, like they do Ford motor cars. I went in Ford. Oh, I don't know about 1955, maybe. <clears throat> I looked through that great system in Detroit, staggering thing. You know, metal at one end and a Ford end, it comes out at the other end. And about 20 of us had a guide, and he explained everything. And I knew no more when I came out than when I went in about the metals and other things. And then he said, now you've had our super tour and all this. He said, any questions? Nobody ever asked a question. <coughs> well, that's strange. He said, usually I get a dozen questions. Now, if you have a question, would you raise your hand? No question. I raised my hand. Yes, sir. What is your question? I said, do you give samples? <laughs> <laughs> he said, no. No. You know, whether you're, whether you're here, or whether you go to Waiwan, or whether you go to Agape, or whether you go somewhere, there's no such thing as an assembly line. You can all have the same instruction, and some of you it will roll out in one ear and out at the other. And some of you will assimilate it, and some go too deep and get too introspective, and others just say, well, our God doesn't expect us to be perfect down here. And most of us, you know, we, we may not like to wear second-hand clothes too much, so that wouldn't worry me that much. But I'll tell you what, most of us wear second-hand theology somebody else's opinions. Now you'll change your opinions often, but you don't change your convictions very often. And it's convictions that keep us steady. They keep us anchored down. And I know this, that day by day, every day I need that gracious mercy of God. He, he could do so many things with me, but he doesn't do it. Not because I deserve it, because he's merciful. What does the old hymn say? He's slow to chide and he's swift to bless. You find yourself always, you know, that one person that somehow ages you and you're always trying to jump on them and uh, get hold of them for every fault they have. Or do you say, wait a minute, wait a minute, I used to be cranky like that, God have patience with me. I mean, uh, you know, as again, sanctification is a process and a crisis, a process and a crisis, except it's not on the level, it's uphill. Come on, you sang it tonight. You fell in the trap. I'm pressing on the upward way. New high time gaining every day. Will you be higher up the hill? Those hills always challenge me that. I could climb those hills, but I couldn't climb the real ones. <clears throat> but is it really true, or is it just a poetic, beautiful thing? New high time gaining every day. When I get up in the morning, is it, oh, oh, uh, we're going to sun till now. I'm going to get down to pennies. They have a sale. I saw that dress before, and now there's $10 off it. I'm going down there. But a guy's going now. What, what fills my horizon? After all, we don't live a year at a time, or a week at a time, we live a day at a time. What's my, what's my ambition today? Not will somebody send me, slip a note under the door, send me ten dollars, or tell you I'll give you this. Is my ambition today, first of all, not what I'll get out of it, but what he will get out of me, that I will be pleasing to him, that there's no discord in my spirit, that he can order me around as he likes, and I say, yes, faith, shall cry a joyous yes to every dear command of thine. Now next week we'll, no, I don't teach next week, week after if I'm home, I'm not sure I'll be home. But we'll come down to the nitty gritty, the center of the whole thing. Blessed are the pure in heart. Well that's a whopper, isn't it? Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. That's not a very good translation. For they see God. They see God in everything. Adversity, calamity, prosperity, it makes no difference. They see through it that the hand of God is in this thing. That again, God is not capricious. God doesn't pull tricks. 
God isn't giving me her twice as much as he gives to her. No, 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 no. If he is, do you know why? Because he's got more confidence in her. He'll not put upon us more than we're able to bear. You see, it's easy to get a, a kind of prefabricated theology. This is what we believe here at, at uh, uh, Agape Force. This is what we, we believe at Wylon. This is what we believe somewhere. That, that's easy. But again, when it comes to the nitty-gritty, it's work out your own salvation with fear and with trembling. Not, well, that's a nice job she's doing. I, uh, you know, I wouldn't mind if she left. I'd, I'd like to fill that post. I remember a lovely, look. Lo in fact, the first American girl I think I'd ever seen. She came to the Worldwide Evangelization Crusade in London. Oh, she was a stunner. She was charming. She wasn't a beautiful blonde, she was a brunette and a very lovely face, lovely features. And uh, I'd heard about her coming to London and I went to a convention and sure enough they called on the platform. Oh wow, what a girl. I don't mean sex appeal, I mean she had charm and charisma and looked so lovely and everything else, you know, she seemed to float on the platform. I thought, mm, mercy, all American girls like this. And she said, well, I want to tell you very humbly how the Lord's been dealing with me. Uh, after all, I came down to a, a school in London. I think I was the only girl with double degrees. And um, I thought surely oh, they'd have a lovely place for me in the office. They'd see my talents, my ability. Have you ever felt that, that, that the church doesn't know what it's doing with you, all that latent ability and nobody's discovered it yet? I mean, you know, how important you could really be, uh, what a lot you could... So she said, um, I looked around and thought, yeah, well... <laughs> that girl doesn't type very fast and the girl over there isn't doing a very efficient job and man, well, I've got all these techniques and I mean we're ahead of you, you know, in, from America and I can, I can really get this place going. And she said, I said, well, what, uh, do I have an assignment tomorrow? Yes. Um, we, the, the rising bell is six o'clock, of course, and there's no, nobody speaks. Everything's total silence like a monastery. You must have one quiet hour with God. And then at seven o'clock, uh, we meet and sing a hymn and we have a scripture reading and then at half past seven we have breakfast and then at eight o'clock we begin our various duties. Yeah, your uh, assignment tomorrow is, and it was a big old house, it isn't there anymore, but I'm glad I did go in it when Norman Grubb was living there. And uh, your job is, you know, all on the, uh, how many were there, one, two, three, four stories I think and two on each story, your job is to uh, take care of the toilets. Take care of what? Yeah, just go scrub the toilet bowls and see that everything's in order. And, and you know, she had one of these royal kind of dresses on. She hadn't come with some old gear like some of you girls wear around the farm, which is all right. She got pretty, almost party dresses on. And she said, there I was next morning with a bucket and a big scrubbing brush. I, I could hardly hold it with two hands and a big bar of that carbolic soap that, phew, you want to work with it like this, you know, it's so strong, it's cleaned your sinuses out and the water's so hot and, and the toilets my goodness she said I was having the battle of my life God here I am saved sanctified talented <laughs> <laughs> down on my knees with all this junk all this muck I must have missed it I could have been used in so many ways in so many other places and, and she said the Lord said no no I can't use you anywhere if I can't use you here. If I can't use you in the lowest job and the men most menial job. God Nelson tells a story, as he didn't tell me, someone else told me, he went to the induction of a young man who had graduated with some honours and he was going into a church where you have to wear your collar backwards. Well, I used to wear that, you know, when I was going backwards. But uh, this young fellow came in his immaculate suit and his collar there, you know, and his grandmother was at the front <laughs> weeping at Oh, is my grandson graduated, what a lovely fellow. Sure was, everything was right. And she put him through college, you know, and through seminary. And they were prepared for this great, wonderful induction. I think a bishop was there to do the celebration, but they'd asked Gordon to speak because he's a, a reputable theologian. And you know, if you see a bishop in the Church of England, he wears a, a, a yard of cloth, a yard wide, a yard deep, on black tape, and he puts it round his waist. That's at his induction. It's awkward to walk around him, but he wears it. Why? Well, it's in memory of the time when Jesus took a towel and girded himself. 
And the speaker said about this young man, you've come up through college, you've kept yourself unspotted from the world, and you've graduated in seminary, and now we're going to confer this honor upon you and whatnot. And Gordon just stood there and said, you've just signed your life away to be a servant. That's what Jesus was, a servant. Great to have a servant's heart. I think it was Isaac Watts that wrote the hymn, My Heart and Voice I Raise, and the second stanza is a servant's form he wore. And in his body bore our dreadful curse on Calvary. He like a victim stood and poured his sacred blood to set us guilty captives free. A servant. You need a lot of grace to be a servant. A lot of patience to be a servant. Anybody can be a boss. You do this, you do that, you do this, and out. Anybody can give orders, but sometimes taking them from somebody who's mentally you're inferior, or socially you're inferior, or spiritually inferior, fancy, letting her boss over me, I mean, good night, what's going on here? Huh? Oh, how beautiful it is when we have what the good book says, the ornament of a meek and acquired spirit. When I'm always willing not to condone the sin of the other man, but say, wait a minute, I want to be patient in this, I want to show mercy. <coughs> God has shown mercy unto me. I want to be a merciful person because mercy is an out attribute of love. It's the activity of love. It's compassion that's finding an excuse to, uh, as we would say, uh, fall over backwards, if you like. I'll do anything in my... Uh, that's possible to give that guy a second chance. The danger is, you see, I can look at you as a class, just you just folk, you've flown in from here, there, and everywhere, you're saying, no, 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 I don't see you as that. I see you as sheep. Not suggesting you're as stupid as sheep, but uh, we're sheep. That's what the book says. We're the sheep of his pasture. You're not my property. You're not, you're, uh, you're not, I was going to say teen challenge, you're not uh, last day's property. You're God's property. I can remember when it dawned upon me once, my wife, wait a minute, she's my wife, yes, but first of all, she's, she's God's property. How would I treat the wife of Jesus if she lived in our home? That's how I should treat my wife. I try to do that, I hope I do. See, we live in a rough and tumble world, a world of competition, a world that's full of avarice, a world that's full of grudges, a world that's unkind, a world where if you touch some people, they uh, shake hands, you almost bleed. They're so severe, so critical, so harsh, so unforgiving, so impatient. But when the Lord really comes and cleanses that heart, it, it, it's not that I'm striving to live the Christian life, it's the Christian life controls me, not that I control the Christian life, except that my will is in harmony with the will of God. That when self has been dethroned and he is on the throne, then it's comparatively easy, because if you love anybody, you, you never say, well, I'd like to do it for you, dear, but you know... <laughs> I'm sorry, it's, it's a bit too difficult. Love loves a challenge. Love loves to do something that will make its lover happy. And if Charles Wesley was right in his hymn, Jesus, you lover of my soul, and he is the lover of our souls. And you can look, look up into his face every morning and say, Lord, today I want to love you more when I end the day than I did at the beginning. Or you can get up and just say, well, let's see, what am I going to do today? Pennies or... Oh, the car going to car for I have a bundle of things to take to town, or there's a wheel off a tractor, so it come on. Wait a minute, let's get everything in gear, let's let's get my mind. That will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee. I've got to stabilize my mind and my heart and my spirit. I've got to drive uh, stakes in the ground, and there are things I will not do, and things I will never do. I think I find that men like Wesley, men like um, David Brainard, they, 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 yeah, they made a kind of Ten Commandments of their own. Wesley said he would never stay in the presence of people more than 15 minutes if he visited a home because he said so often conversation becomes gossip and I don't want anything to do with it. He would be in bed every night by 9 o'clock so that he could always rise by 4 o'clock. He vowed he wouldn't buy... Uh, a powder to powder his wig which they did in those days because that money could go to the poor you make your own commandments 
it's, a, it's an operation between you and God. It's not a it's not a pattern where everybody's squashed into the same mold. Even if you're saved, if you're sanctified, if you're spirit filled, if you have a ministry, we're also a variable. And yet the one supreme thing is we're going to love the Lord our God with all our heart and all our soul and all our mind and all our strength. Let me say one thing. A friend of mine, his family left England and went to um, they went to South Africa, and they. Uh, they left a son behind who was about, I think he was about 12 or 13. And amazingly enough, when they got to Africa, they'd been in Africa about a year, when the lady found she was pregnant again. She couldn't believe it. I got a 12 or a 13 year old boy in England? Well, that's, that's about 40, 50 years back, nearly 40 years back. And uh, there was no quick communication, no, there was no radio. I'm not sure if there was even a radio telephone in those days. And it was decided that the younger son in uh, South Africa would come to a school in London. Oh, that's great, because his, his older brother, his eldest brother is in London. And so, there were no planes, he got on the ship. And the ship came up the Thames estuary, it, it actually docked in London. But the point was that the, that the boy that was coming, he was now about, say, 14, had never seen his brother, who was uh, about 27 or 8, something like that, 26 or something. And you know when the boat when the boat came in at Tilbury, everybody's hey, hey, look at that hey, oh, 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 you know everybody's shouting, and he's standing there, oh, 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 moving up the boat, you know. Oh, there's hundreds of men, in the, oh, hundreds, of, oh, massive, massive. And he waited and waited and waited, and the crowd filtered away. But you know, there's two men leaning over the side of the dock on the on the rail there. And he thought, I can't be my brother, neither of those are my brother. Well, I'm in a mess. Here I am, thousands of miles away from home. I've no address to go to. What will I do? Go to the police? What will I say? And he's working this out. And suddenly one of the men turned round and put his hands behind his back and he walked down the thing and he said, Hey! And shouted his name. He said, Jack! Jack! Hi! He said, well, you've been watching me for about 10 minutes or 15 minutes and you didn't give any signal. No. But when I turned my back and walked away, you recognized me. How in the world did you recognize me? He said, because you walk exactly like your father. Hmm? Well, that's a convincing thing, isn't it? It's not if you have more pretty dresses than she has, or this guy has uh, more muscle than he has. Are you walking like your father? And God says to Abraham, walk before me. All we talk about it, Enoch walk with God. But God says to Abraham, walk before me and be thou perfect. Oh, now, come on. Well, the Hebrew word there is, be, walk before me and be unblemished. Doesn't sound quite as tough, does it? Walk without a blemish. You know, these ladies, many of them not, uh, some ladies have to get on the scales now and again for certain reasons, but uh, some ladies get on the scales every morning, faithfully, every morning, or at night. <sighs> Gained a half ounce this week. Oh, mercy. Oh, isn't that terrible? Gained a half ounce. My dress wouldn't button cry. Oh, I'm going to have to do something about that. And Gabriel doesn't care a hill of beans if you weigh a ton more than he did. You shouldn't weigh a ton more, of course. But are we, are we as careful about our spiritual condition? Do we check up on our spiritual life without getting into bondage over it? Am I really walking as he walked? I mean, today, has my speech been unblemished? If, if I could take my heart out and wear it on my sleeve and somebody could see it, would it have scars in it? Would it have bitterness? Would it have enmity in it? Would it have a, a grudging disposition? Would it be that there's somebody here I don't like? Now, you know... And the little girl said uh, that her mother and daddy liked the doctor. She said, I don't like him. You don't know. She wrote a little poem. I do not like you, Dr. Fell. <laughs> the reason why, I cannot tell. But this I know and know full well. I do not like you, Dr. Fell. <laughs> well, that's about the logic some people have. Why don't you like her? Well, I don't like her hairstyle, or I don't like him for this. Come on. Are we judging by worldly standards? Are we offering mercy where we have to offer it? Are we being generous in our compassions, in our thinking? Am I walking day by day like Jesus would walk if he were my gear? 
Am I able to say as Jesus said, I do the, all those, those things which please the Father? You know, if you're not careful, even in the Christian life, people live by events. Do you know where we're going? We're going to a big conference soon at so-and-so. I got a call the other day to go to this conference that Billy Graham and all the big shots will be having in Kansas City. I think it's next week. Oh, my, one time I say, yeah, yeah, you sure I'll be there. You know, I actually sat next to the table. In fact, I don't got no near that shoulder because I happened to rub my Billy Graham with his coat on. So <laughs> it have a shield on it. You know, so nobody will touch it, you know. Shook hands, who do you think? You know who shook hands with? So and so, that's great celebrity. I'm not going to wash that hand for weeks. We get, if you're not careful, we get into the traps that other people get in. We judge the Lord by feeble sense. We judge by this event where we were invited, they weren't invited. So what? When I hear people were invited, I, went, I praise the Lord. Thank God it saved me having to refuse to go. <laughs> He gave me more time to think on the Lord or work for the Lord or meditate on the Lord. You see, character built. You're born with a disposition. I'm through with this. You're born with a disposition. You built character. You built character. And we build it by knowing God's word and we build it by not only, as Mrs. Wesley said, there are two things to do with the gospel. Believe it and behave it. And we've been very strong on the believing you don't mean to say that you believe in a post-tribulation rapture? <laughs> goodness me, my goodness, you must have been brought up somewhere in the boondocks. <laughs> and they say, you don't mean to say you believe in a pre-tribulation rapture, do you? Oh, what trivialities divide us. We get into little camps and little prejudices. God wants us to grow up. It's too late when we get up there. It's too late then. There's grace abundant for all that we need to do. There's wisdom for the asking. There's patience. And all the fruits of the Spirit, if the, if the Spirit is resident and has, a, has his authority that he'll do some pruning, he'll do some correcting, that he's not capricious, he doesn't do it for fun, he does it that I may be made it perfect in the sense of perfect obedience and perfect submission and perfect love before God. And God wants to put us on exhibition. That's what he says. He says, he says that he can, we are his workmanship. And he says we're made a spectacle to the world. And he puts you somewhere so all the grace of God can flow through your life. And somebody else can see in a wicked, rotten, perverted world like this, you can live straight in a crooked world. You can live pure in an impure world. You can live in a world of love where there's so much hatred and show forth the praise of him who called us out of darkness into his most marvelous light. Let's pray. Father, tonight we thank you for the redemptive work of Jesus. Lord, we would have this patience, this love, this grace in our lives that, like Joseph, if we're sold into bondage and forgotten and neglected and we have to suffer because of the envy of others, that, Lord, we may have grace ultimately to bestow blessing on them, not revenge. That when our, our enemy we could subdue them, destroy them, and yet we show patience and love. We're asking again that the beauty of the Lord our God may be upon us. But each day we shall grow in grace and in the knowledge of the, our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ. And we'll give you praise in his name.